Make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe below for more ghoulish tales. The light of the setting sun barely lit the room. I struggled to keep my eyes open. My wife and I just sat talking in the living room. I say talking, but it was mostly me. Rambling on about everyday things, I'm unsure if she even heard me. She looked even more tired than I felt. Barely keeping her head up, I threw her a loving smile. Suddenly, the doorbell rang, disturbing the peace. Peering through the window, I saw a police officer, standing straight with a somber look on his face. With raised eyebrows, I opened the door. How may I help you today, officer? I have urgent information to everyone in the area that there is a very dangerous man on the loose. Yesterday, he killed a man and is believed to have abducted a young woman in the process. Christ, I said, my heart sinking. He, he killed someone? Here, in our neighborhood? Perhaps the officer saw the genuine shock on my face because he gave me a bitter smile. Oh yeah, the victim was stabbed at least 50 times. It's hard to tell, he said, shaking his head. You just don't think that these sort of wicked things could happen around here. The officer looked me in the eyes. Well, if you have any, and I mean any, information that it could at least lead to finding the girl or capturing this man, please let us know. I also recommend you avoid going out alone during the evenings. For a while, at least, he said. Yes, of course, officer, I said back. Good. Take care. I closed the door in disbelief, a little shaken up by what I just heard. You won't believe this, I shouted while walking back to the living room. They are already looking for you. I work in a wildlife rehabilitation center in the middle of the forest atop a hill, about 20 minutes away from the nearest streetlight. It's a beautiful property during the day, but at night, you can hardly see your hand in front of your face unless the moon is high enough over the trees to shed a little bit of light on the area. For privacy's sake, I won't be giving the name or location of the facility. I started working here last year, usually being put on the closing shift, which is 11 a.m. to 9 p.m., but we typically were on property until the wee hours of the morning since the sheer number of animals in the care prevented us from going home before everything was complete. The facility itself is deeply haunted. I've known this since a couple of weeks into my employment. One of the routes of the Trail of Tears actually went right through what is now the property, but more on this later. These are some of the stories I've collected while working here. One night, as we were all wrapping up downstairs and getting ready to shut down for the evening, the doorbell rang. It must have been around 10 p.m. by then, and we usually close admissions by 5 usually. All of our admissions are by appointment only, but on occasion, we'll get a walk-in. With a sign... My coworker goes upstairs to greet the person and take the animal down for a quick examination. After a few minutes, she comes back down, empty-handed and looking a bit unsettled. Upon being asked what the problem was, she answered, There was no one at the door, and there's no other car in the lot. This has happened at least two other times. 
I've always been a little sensitive to the paranormal, but I'm very skeptical by nature. I want to first rule out any other possible scenarios before jumping to the conclusion of something otherworldly, so I chalk these situations up as electrical errors. The building took on a whole new energy at night. Rooms of the facility that were well lit and normal during the day felt more ominous at night. I never wanted to be alone inside by myself after 8.30. After 8.30, things got weird. Mostly, it's just the feeling that I'm being watched, or thinking I see something out of the corner of my eye. It's all just very unsettling. As one of our interns was leaving one night, she said she heard someone calling to her from the parking lot. Psst. Hey. Over here. There was no one there. One night, my coworkers went outside to finish up an animal care in some of the outside enclosures that hadn't been done during the day, and I was left alone inside to finish preparing diets for some of the raccoon babies we had inside. We had a microwave above the counter, and I'd long since gotten used to seeing my silhouette in the reflective sheen on the door. I reached up to retrieve the bowl I had put in the microwave and shut the door once I was done, only to see the reflection of a silhouette behind me. I whipped around so fast I nearly dropped the bowl. No one was standing behind me. And when I looked back into the reflection, the silhouette wasn't there anymore. As I said previously, the trail of tears ran through the property, and at least two of my other co-workers have made separate comments about seeing a woman in Buckshine either walking through the hallway or standing in the laundry room. She always moves out of sight before anyone can try to say something to her. We have a separate little building on the property that's now a storage unit. It once housed interns that would stay on site overnight, but it's been a long time since it's been used for that purpose. I've always gotten a weird feeling whenever I'm near it. I've never been inside, and I hope I never have to. Anytime I walk past it, I feel incredibly unsettled. Like there's someone standing behind me or watching me. Several months ago, I was informed we no longer have interns living in the building because late one night, a man walked in and stood in the doorway staring at the interns while they were all trying to sleep. Since then, we've installed trail cams on security cameras all over the property. There's a million more stories I could talk about this place, and maybe one day I will. So far, these are the only the true paranormal feeling ones that I have to tell. I'll be sure to update when I can. If I'm still alive. I have lived alone for a while now and the somewhat reasonable fears of being robbed or attacked in the depths of the night seem to no longer bother me. You'd think living alone would be challenging, but in fact, it's quite peaceful. My house is situated in a remote area of the country. Scenic and Victorian, you know, the type with a thatched roof that's singing from ancient fires and the walls that are encompassed with dust and dirt. Occasionally, the cobwebs become tough to deal with, alongside the poor signal, but the whole property was a stunning sight, especially the paintings. That was until they started acting weird. It was a Wednesday when I first noticed it, during the aggressive downpour. As I shook myself off, I glanced a look at the painting that hung before me on the kitchen wall. The girl in my painting was dead. It wasn't like that before, I'm sure of it. Yet the slash of blood across her pale neck indicated that she was far from alive. I'm not usually the one to believe in the supernatural. I shrugged the event off and didn't give it much contemplation. 
I rolled it down to a sick prank one of my good friends had been pulling. We hadn't been on good terms recently, and I wouldn't put it past him to have done something like that. Deciding to get rid of it, I signed in disappointment at the loss of such lovely artwork. A couple more days passed by before more problems arose. This time, an oil painting of a Tudor couple were victims to the brutal attack. These two were bloodier though. The crimson liquid seeped into the finery they fashioned. Their jewelry had stained and rusted. However, I still put this all down to a joke and thought it best to ignore despite my concerns. After all, it was only a couple of paintings, no harm done. The final straw was when I returned home from the shops this afternoon and the delicate woman beside my bed door had been mangled beyond repair. This was my favorite piece. I wouldn't stand for this anymore. As I called the friend who I thought was behind this, something clicked in place inside my head. Reaching up to feel the canvas, a chill shudders down my spine. The linen doesn't have incisions in it. The blood stains must be painted on. But I was out for ten minutes. How could the painting have dried so quick? My thoughts were interrupted as the ringing of my phone cuts to my friend's trembling voice. Christopher? I didn't mean for it to go this far. I didn't know what he was. I whip my head around and I am greeted by an oily figure with a grin as wide as a cat's. Its movements are heavy as it crawls up the stairs towards me. The rips of its bloody knife scraping against the paintings is the only sound I could hear. We all know about this situation. It's one of the classic plots for many horror movies. A kid is lying awake in his bed and what keeps him up at night is the shadowy figure on the wall. Maybe it's just a coat. Someone may have hung it there. He can think like that, but the only problem is he doesn't remember noticing it before going to bed. You see, the real horror happens inside our heads. And from now on, there can be countless possible endings for this story. You can reveal it as a ghost, a monster, a serial killer, etc. Or you can simply tell the readers it's just a cloak hanging there for some reasons you could come up with, making it a happy ending. But for me, it's completely different. I'm watching him right now, and I know he's awake, perhaps a little bit scared as well. I could tell from his movement under the blanket that he's having a hard time figuring out what he's looking at. His father's coat. It's the only thing protecting my body from the winter's air. Despite how cold it is, I must not move or make any sound. It's kind of ironic that I'm sure I feel much more terrified than he does. I could only hope he won't be too scared that he goes to wake up his father. Their house is just one big maze, so complicated that finding the way out seems almost impossible. And as my muscles begin to shake uncontrollably, I start to regret my decision to escape from the basement. This poor boy will never realize what his father has done to me and the others down here. That man, he's the real monster in this story. And for tonight, I want to be nothing more than his coat. The wind swept up and around Arnold's face, filling his eyes and nose with dust. He coughed and spit while staring off towards the whining sun. 
Arnold squinted but never blinked, trying his best to focus on the figure at the edge of the field. The figure that had just eluded him over the past several miles. The figure that, even now, seemed to blink in and out of existence. When they drugged the four eviscerated bodies from the cavern and began the long, slow process of burying them in the hard-packed clay, Arnold's friends had warned him. Three weeks later, when Arnold was building a rock kern over, those same friends he remembered their words. Don't go after that thing, Arnold. It's not of this world. Brian had said this over and over. Brian was now under a layer of rocks. Arnold urged his horse forward, eyes never leaving the distant figure. The figure itself paid absolutely no attention to Arnold, seemingly going on its way. Every few minutes blimping out of sight and then reappearing. It was carrying something. At this distance, it was hard to make out. But due to the blood trail, Arnold had little doubt it was another body. Arnold leveled his rifle, fired, and spurred his horse into a gallop. He got close, real close. Arnold could see the figure now. It was humanoid in shape, kind of. It seemed to be created from darkness itself, a shadow folded into something more substantial. The edges of its form blurred in and out, making it hard to focus on it moving quickly, almost too quickly. It stank of death and decay, its very presence an affront to the senses. Arnold leveled up for another shot, all the while spurring his horse on faster and straighter forward. It all happened at once. The shot rang out like a cannon. Arnold's horse reared and bucked, throwing him off of the side. The figure had turned at the same moment to regard Arnold, piercing him with its cold dead eyes. And then, the blackness enveloped Arnold, drowning out everything. And he found himself sitting in the cold and damp darkness all around. He could see nothing, until he looked and there besides him sat Brian. The clock read exactly 3 a.m. and I couldn't sleep. I had this strange feeling of being watched and I just couldn't shake it. I turned around to look out my window, and that's when I saw her, the one who had been watching me. She was standing on the road outside my house, just staring. Both her arms are twisted at unnatural angles, looking extremely broken. All her weight was leaning on one leg, as the other one seemed completely limp. Most jarring, however, was her face. What wasn't caved in grotesquely or covered in blood bore an expression of pure terror. She needed help. She needed to get to the hospital. Quickly as I could, I grabbed my phone and called 911 and rushed outside to help her. The wind was chilly. The night was dark, and the woman was nowhere to be found. Where could she have gone? It's not like she could have moved very fast in her condition, and she would have left a trail of blood even if she could. I'm too distracted by those thoughts to notice the car speeding towards me. I didn't feel the impact, but I hear it. I hear my bones breaking, the car horn bearing, and the worst of all is my own screams. My shock and adrenaline allow me to stand up, just in time to see the car drive away. I look around for anyone to help me, 
and my eyes land on my own window. In it is my own face, shocked and terrified. The clock behind me reads exactly 3 a.m. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed these six scary stories tonight. I just love anything in the paranormal. Any type of cryptid creatures. Any insane asylums. Hell, anything just spooky. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Share it with your friends. And have a great night. Ooh.